Did Jephthah really offer his daughter as a sacrifice on an altar to God? This is the question that we seek to answer today as we continue our verse by verse study of the book of Judges on walking through the Bible. Today we're going to be discussing Judges 11 verses 29 to 40, but before we do that, let's read the passage. If you have a Bible with you, you can turn to Judges 11 verse 29, but if you don't have a Bible, don't worry, just follow along with us on the screen. The version that we'll be reading from is the New King James Version. So Judges chapter 11, beginning at verse 29. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, and he passed through Gilead and Manasseh, and passed through Mizpah of Gilead. And from Mizpah of Gilead he advanced towards the people of Ammon. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will indeed deliver the people of Ammon into my hands, then it will be that whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me, when I return in peace from the people of Ammon, shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up as a burnt offering. So Jephthah advanced towards the people of Ammon to fight against them, and the Lord delivered them into his hands. And he defeated them from Aurora as far as Minith, twenty cities, and to Abel, Kiramim, with a very great slaughter. Thus the people of Ammon were subdued before the children of Israel. When Jephthah came to his house at Mizpah, there was his daughter, coming out to meet him with timbrels and dancing, and she was his only child. Besides her he had neither son nor daughter. And it came to pass, when he saw her, that he tore his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, you have brought me very low. You are among those who trouble me, for I have given my word to the Lord, and I cannot go back on it. She said to him, My father, if you have given your word to the Lord, do to me according to what has gone out of your mouth, because the Lord has avenged you of your enemies, the people of Ammon. Then she said to her father, Let this thing be done for me. Let me alone for two months, that I may go and wander on the mountains, and bewail my virginity, my friends and I. So he said, Go. And he sent her away for two months, and she went with her friends and bewailed her virginity on the mountains. And it was so at the end of two months that she returned to her father, and he carried out his vow with her which he had vowed. She knew no man. And it became a custom in Israel that the daughters of Israel went four days each year to lament the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileadite. Here at the end of chapter 11, the year is around 1100 BC and the Ammonites have been oppressing Israel for about 18 years at this point. Israel had repented of her sins and had put away those false gods from before them and as such God had agreed to deliver Israel from Ammon and Jephthah was selected to do so. Jephthah was not a perfect man for he was a pirate before he delivered Israel. But he wasn't completely a depraved man either for he knew the law of God and what was expected. How do we know? because he gave the king of Ammon a history lesson as to why Ammon didn't have a right to take the land away from Israel, for God had given Israel that land as the law of Moses states. The king of Ammon didn't heed the words of Jephthah, and so war was going to ensue. Verse 29 says that the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, meaning God was with Jephthah and would by his power deliver Ammon into Jephthah's hands. Before the battle, Jephthah made a vow to the Lord that if the Lord would deliver the people of Ammon into his hands, that whatever came out of the doors of his house to greet him when he returned in peace would be the Lord's and would be offered up as a burnt offering. This vow made by Jephthah here was a foolish one. Why? Well, first of all, vowing something to the Lord was not going to change whether or not the Lord was with Jephthah. Either God was with Jephthah or he wasn't. No amount of bargaining or sacrifice would change that. So this vow was unnecessary in order to secure victory. But the second reason that this vow was foolish is because Jephthah didn't know what he was actually vowing. It could have been anything. And since Jephthah didn't know what he was vowing, when, time, when the time came to pay that vow, chances were going to be high that he would be disappointed. Jephthah, if he really wanted to vow something to the Lord in appreciation for the victory, should have chosen what to vow before the battle, so that there would be no regrets later. We do not get the Lord's response to this vow, but what we do know is that the Lord gave Jephthah the victory. The, ma the map on the screen shows the extent of Jephthah's victory. 
Jephthah began in Mizpah of Gilead, the Mizpah we know to be east of the Jordan, and fought Midian all the way down through what would be the land given to the tribes of Gad and Reuben. This is the land that the Ammonites wanted Israel to give them, land that had formerly been held by Sihon, king of the Amorites, but land that had been given by God to Israel back in the days of Moses. The slaughter was said to be a great slaughter, and that the Ammonites were utterly defeated here. No, they wouldn't become like the Midianites, for they would still oppress Israel in the future, but their oppression of Israel here in the time of Jephthah would be over, for God had delivered Israel out of their hand. Jephthah returned home from war excited, ready to offer to God that which he had vowed. The problem was, his daughter, who was his only child, was the first to greet him upon his return. Jephthah's demeanor immediately changed, for he tore his clothes in sorrow. He told his daughter about his vow, and she told him that he must fulfill his vow. The only thing she requested was that he give her two months so that she could go with her friends into the mountains and bewail or sorrow her virginity, For she was not married and had never had sexual relations with a man, nor would she because of this vow. Jephthah agreed, and upon her return, the passage says that he carried out his vow with her, which he had vowed, and that after that, for four days every year, the daughters of Israel went and lamented the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileadite. The question that everyone has from this story is this. Did Jephthah really offer his daughter as a sacrifice on an altar to God? And a cursory reading of the text could very well lead us to conclude that Jephthah did. Wouldn't that be against God's law? Yes, for Leviticus 18.21 is where God condemns human sacrifice as an abomination to him under the law of Moses, a law that Jephthah knew. So if Jephthah did this, wouldn't he have sinned and incurred the wrath of God? And the answer to that is yes as well. And yet we don't read of God's wrath. We don't read of the author of Judges commenting on the evil of Jephthah's actions, like he spoke about the evils of Israel's idolatry constantly throughout the book. Chapter 12 will continue with the story of Jephthah, telling us that Jephthah would judge Israel six more years after this, with nothing more said about this incident. And then in the New Testament, Jephthah is referred to as a man of faith in the same chapter as Abraham and David and Moses. How could Jephthah be referred to this way if he offered his daughter on an altar to God, something that is an abomination to God and is worthy of death? Sure, we could come along and say that Jephthah could have repented and God forgiven him, but we don't read of that either. Whenever we're faced with a tough scripture like this, it is best to go back and examine if our conclusions are correct. Yes, the passage says that Jephthah vowed to offer a burnt offering, But does the passage say that Jephthah sacrificed his daughter on an altar to God? No, it does not. But if Jephthah's daughter was to be a burnt sacrifice, how is it possible that Jephthah fulfilled his vow without offering her up on an altar to God? For that, we need to recall a few things about sacrifices under the law of Moses. First of all, Leviticus 27 made provisions that anything vowed to the Lord could be redeemed. This included persons, according to verses 1 to 5 of that chapter. So why couldn't Jephthah simply redeem his daughter? Because of the fact that she was his firstborn, and as such, Exodus 13 verse 1 says that she was dedicated to the Lord and was considered his already. Had she been a son, she would have been redeemed from serving in the tabernacle on account the Levites did that. But it wouldn't have changed the fact that as the firstborn, she would have been considered dedicated to the Lord already. Thus, if she was vowed to the Lord in a separate vow, the person who made the vow could not redeem her from the vow, according to Leviticus 27, 28. For she already belonged to the Lord, and that which belonged to the Lord could not be redeemed. Otherwise, the vow would be meaningless. So, we understand why she couldn't be redeemed, but that doesn't mean she wasn't sacrificed on an altar, for after all, she was to be a burnt offering. And this brings us to the second point. Not all burnt offerings were actually burnt on an altar. Numbers 15 verse 3 tells us that free will offerings were referred to as burnt offerings, and yet 2 Chronicles 31 14 and Ezra 8 28 makes clear that free will offerings included things that could be distributed, such as money, and would thus not be burnt on an altar, yet still be considered a burnt offering. What we need to understand is that a burnt offering was an offering given wholly over to God. 
The meat of the animal of a burnt offering, according to Leviticus 1, was not eaten, as was prescribed with some of the other sacrifices, but wholly burnt on the altar. Thus, if something was being given wholly over to God, it could be described as a burnt offering, even though it might not be burnt on an altar. I believe that this is what Paul has in mind in Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, when he says that Christians are to present our bodies as living sacrifices, meaning we're to devote our lives wholly to God and His service. He is hearkening us back to what the burnt offering was to be. So coming back to Judges 11, are there signs in the chapter which would tell us that Jephthah's daughter was a burnt offering to God but not physically burnt on an altar? And the answer to that is yes. First, when she asked for two months, what was, she, what was the purpose? To bewail her virginity, not her shortened life. Someone who is destined to die would certainly bewail their death too, not simply the fact that they would shortly die as a virgin. Next, Judges 11.39 says that Jephthah carried out his vow and his daughter knew no man. Now, if the daughter was dead, of course she knew no man, for she was dead. But if Jephthah carried out his vow, but his daughter was not dead, but only devoted to the service of the Lord in the tabernacle, then such a statement would make sense, for she would have remained a virgin all of her life because of that service in the tabernacle. And then, of course, you have a lack of condemnation for such an egregious act, either here in Judges or anywhere else that Jephthah is mentioned. Although silence alone does not prove anything, in this case, it does speak volumes. David's sin with Bathsheba is remembered. Abraham's lie to Pharaoh is remembered. Moses striking the rock instead of speaking to it is remembered. Men of faith do sin, but their sin is pointed out as wrong by God, and when it is repented of, only then it is, it, is it forgiven. Sin is never overlooked and then later celebrated. Jephthah's vow, though foolish and though costly in that he would not have any heirs, is not condemned as sinful when it is completed, and since it isn't, the only conclusion I believe we can draw from this is that Jephthah did devote his daughter to the service of the Lord, and she performed that service all the remaining days of her life, but that Jephthah did not sacrifice his daughter on an altar to God, for such would have been an abomination. With that, our time is up for today. Tomorrow is Victoria Day in Ontario, Canada, so we will be taking a one-day break and return the Lord willing on Tuesday, May 24th, 2022. When we return, we hope you'll join us for our discussion of Judges 12, verses 1 to 7, as we continue our walk through the Bible, one verse at a time. I'm not a Thank you for watching today's episode. We hope that you found it edifying and ask that you not only subscribe to our channel and podcast, but that you like and share this episode among your friends so that the saving gospel of Jesus Christ can go out to the whole world. Of his cross.